What could a woman do when pushed to the breaking point? What could a woman raised in a staunchly religious home do when pushed to the breaking point by her preacher husband? One woman answered this question with a shotgun shell. Mary Carol Winkler. Mary Carol Freeman, now known as Mary Carol Winkler, was born in Knoxville, Tennessee, December 10th, 1973, to Clark and Mary Nell Freeman. She was raised in a relatively nice suburban area in southwest Knoxville called Frontier Trail, which consisted of mostly white people who made an average income of $42,000 a year and homes were valued at $100,000 on average per census statistics. Clark flipped houses while Mary Neal was a teacher, both devout Christians who attended Laurel Church of Christ. In fact, they were so devout and devoted to the church that Clark served as a deacon for it. Though this seems like a very quiet and normal life, the Freemans experienced their first traumatic loss when the youngest child of the family passed away. Patricia Freeman, a quadriplegic who had been suffering her whole life, passed away in 1982 during a seizure. Not long after her passing, the Freemans adopted five children from the same family, two boys and three girls. Mary Carroll was devastated by the loss of her sister, and I wouldn't be surprised if the adoption of five siblings was equally traumatic to an eight or nine-year-old, but she occupied herself with her work and her faith. She took as many extracurricular activities to occupy herself as she could, her high school years being the best example of this, as she was active in the following high school choir, religious societies, tennis, Spanish club, and future teachers of America. In 1992, she graduated from South Doyle High and enrolled in David Lipscomb University, a very well-known religious college located in Nashville. She then transferred to Freed Hardman University in Henderson, another Christian university that was known for preaching modesty to its students. Nine of ten students were Church of Christ members that attended to major in business, Bible study, fine arts, education, or science and math. Students were also required to attend daily chapel service with strict midnight curfews and a fashion and grooming standard that promotes quote-unquote modesty and appropriateness. The dorms were also separated by their sex and only allowed members of the opposite sex to visit during a very interesting event that occurs once a year. The university website describes this event as follows. Halloween provides a unique activity on campus. Students are allowed to trick or treat in dorms of the opposite sex. This is the only time during the school year when members of the opposite sex are allowed to visit each other's dorms beyond the lobbies. Yep, sounds about right for a Christian university. Friends would describe Mary Carroll as a nice girl that was quiet and unassuming with a pretty smile and a positive attitude towards life. These same friends would also state that this would change when she met her future husband and future victim, Matthew Winkler. In all honesty, I couldn't find nearly as much about Matthew as it did about Mary Carroll, but I will cover what I can of his past. Matthew Winkler was born in Deneo, Nevada on November 21st, 1979, to Dan and Diane Walker, along with two siblings, Dan Jr. and Jacob. He was born into a long line of pastors for the Church of Christ, starting with his paternal grandfather, Wendell Winkler, who was an evangelist that preached in the Southeast for over 50 years, and his father, a traveling preacher. Though his family traveled frequently to follow Dan Sr. in his pursuits as a minister, Matthew would graduate from Austin High School located in Decatur, Alabama, where his father was a preacher for the Beltline Church of Christ. 
While attending high school there, he was a very popular sports star and an athletic guy, which he continued to be in college at Freed Hardman, where his father was a professor and minister. Matthew was described as tall, handsome, and fit, with an infectious smile and a love for life and people, very similar to how Mary Carroll was described by her own friends. Mary Carroll and Matthew Winkler would meet while attending Freed Hardman and get married in the Freeman family backyard with Clark Freeman presiding in 1996. When Mary Carroll would become pregnant with their first child, Patricia, in 1997, they would drop out of college due to financial difficulties. The couple would settle in Nashville, where Matthew would work as a youth minister for the Bellevue Church of Christ congregation and complete his degree in Bible study. Another loss would be felt by the Freeman family as Mary Nell would pass away from cancer and cause Clark and Mary Carroll to become estranged. Mary Alice, or Allie, yes there's a lot of Marys in this family, would be born in 2000 after the death of Mary Nell and Matthew would take a job teaching Bible classes at Boyd Christian School in McMinnville. The principal at the school, Eva Farrell, would comment on Matthew to the Associated Press stating, Matt had it all. He was handsome, he was full of personality, he was smart, but most importantly, he was a good Christian soul. In 2004, Mary Carroll would suffer a miscarriage only to prematurely give birth to a third daughter, Brianna, a year later in March 2005 in Nashville after moving to Selmer for another job taken at 4th Street Church. It is at this church that the beginning of a downward spiral for Mary Carroll and Matthew Winkler began. I know this is a little bit off track, but I believe it is extremely important that I explain the culture of the Church of Christ before I go any further. The Church of Christ is a denomination of Christianity that lived by the literal word of the Bible. Almost all leadership positions are held by men. They believe in the teachings of Paul who states wives must submit to their husbands. They see themselves as a network of like-minded autonomous congregations instead of a denomination, practices full immersion adult baptism, and forbids music being played during services. Within the 4th Street Church, Matthew Winkler held the highest position of pulpit teacher or evangelist and was assisted by elders and deacons, which meant that Mary Carroll was required to hold herself in a very specific manner. The dynamic between Mary Carroll and Matthew is described in detail during a crime library-led interview of Dr. Judy Kuriansky, author of The Complete Idiot's Guide to a Healthy Relationship. There is no question, as we now well know, that people of the cloth have secrets. Religiosity can have dark sides. We don't like to talk about that. We like to think that members of the clergy are only pure in their motivations. The dimensions of a good relationship include compromise and communication. When you don't compromise and communicate, things build up over time. Until someone has walked in the shoes of a pastor's wife, they have no idea what kind of pressure and unrealistic expectations are often put on them. Dr. Kuriansky also describes the way problems are handled within those devoted to the church as gunny sacking, another way of saying that they put problems to the side and refuse to seek help purely from fear of losing their station in the church for being any less than perfect. These problems continue to build and build until there is a violently emotional outburst caused by what Dr. Kuriansky calls a final grand insult. From here, I'm going to skip ahead in time a little bit to the fateful day that brought this case to national attention, March 22nd, 2006, at 6.15 a.m. Mary Carroll woke early that morning, walked to the bedroom closet, and retrieved the loaded 12-gauge shotgun before moving to stand above her husband with the barrel pointed directly at his back. 77 pellets drove into Matthew's body, severing his spine and puncturing several of his organs. He rolled from the bed onto the floor, looking up at her as blood bubbled from his mouth, muttering one word as he breathed his final breaths. Why? The three young children heard the loud boom and came to their parents' bedroom, Patricia opening the door to see her mother dabbing the blood from the corner of her dying father's mouth. She heard him groaning in pain, saw him face down on the floor, and then was told to round up her siblings and get ready to leave. I cannot even begin to imagine the level of trauma that poor girl felt seeing this horrifying scene 
Mary and Carol rounded up the three young girls and threw them into the family minivan with only the shotgun used in the crime and the clothes on their back, running from her sins. She used only the $500 in cash she had on hand to pay for the travel. Matthew's body was found by church members 15 hours later and an Amber Alert was issued for the three children out of fear that Mary Carol had kidnapped them. The four found in Orange Beach, Alabama the next evening. Mary Carroll was arrested and extradited to Tennessee for trial, investigators asking what exactly happened only to receive the following response. I guess that's when my ugly came out. Mary Carol Winkler was indicted for charges of first degree murder on Monday, June 12th, 2006. After five months in jail and with the help of a loan her father put against his property, Mary Carroll posted $750,000 bail and moved to McMinnville, Tennessee to live with an old church friend named Kathy Thompson. And with the beginning of the trial came the details for all the burning questions of the nation. And I'm sure all the questions you have, dear listeners. Why? Why did this even happen? What could have possibly pushed Mary Carol Winkler over the edge into murdering her husband with a shotgun they kept in their closet? The first sign of answers came in the November 2006 issue of Glamour magazine. A profile was published with the agreement of her lawyers, Steve Farise and Leslie Ballin, that featured photos of her with a crucifix necklace along with testimony from her father and siblings. Clark Freeman, in no certain terms, stated that he had become estranged from his daughter due to quote-unquote unspeakable abuse at the hands of Matthew. Faris, being the ultimate opportunist, elaborates on this in his own testimony. Only Mary can talk about his temper and how controlling he was. God and Matthew Winkler, these were the two figures she served. Mary did not know up from down and was literally trapped. These same people who testified in the article also showed up around the same time for ABC's Good Morning America to further elaborate. Friends of the family made claims they had seen signs of abuse. Rudy Thompson, a friend of the Winkler, stated, quote, One Sunday, Mary came into the church and I looked at her and she had a black eye. Amy Redman, another friend, would also state he was an authority figure and he made the decisions basically. It was obvious. Tabitha Freeman and Amanda Miller, her sisters, would also speak up. We didn't know if it would get worse if we were to confront it. As the years went on, she seemed to be nervous to show love towards us. Now it's back to the old Mary who loves us and doesn't care to come and hug us and give us a kiss on the cheek. Clark Freeman also spoke more about seeing signs of physical abuse on his daughter. Physical, mental, verbal. I don't know how she took it. She's a stronger individual than I am. I saw bad bruises, the heaviest of makeup covering facial bruises. So one day I confronted her. I said, Mary Carol, you're coming off as a much abused wife, very battered. She would hang her head and say, no daddy, everything's all right. Ballin also chimed in saying, quote, there are all kinds of abuse imaginable that would be talked about at the trial. What went on behind their closed doors is going to have to be told. If you're thinking that the prosecution was already screwed before the trial even started, you'd be right. Prosecutor Walt Freeland tried multiple times to negotiate a plea unsuccessfully and then came into trial seeking a conviction of first degree murder, which carries a 51 year sentence. But the worst part came with jury selection. Some insight on how this was bombed so heavily by the prosecution can be found in comments from longtime New York criminal defense attorney Michael Mendelssohn's interview with Crime Library. The trial shows once again that the most important part of any trial is jury selection. The O.J. Simpson case proved that, and this case proved it again. If you get the right jury, you win. If you don't get the right jury, you lose. This was a Southern jury filled with Southern women. Even today, some Southern women are born into a heritage of difference from their husbands. You might have 10 women sitting on that jury who have experienced that same sort of thing, and here they are judging one woman who had the balls to do something about her situation. They may have been saying, aha, it's get even time. Paris and Ballin made the smart decision of closely questioning jurors about spousal abuse, some of those questions being the following. Can emotional abuse be as damaging as physical abuse? Have you ever talked to someone who wouldn't listen? Have you ever wondered why someone would stay in an abusive relationship? Needless to say, the defense had been stacking the odds against the prosecution from the very beginning. 
probably the only thing the prosecution did attempt to do was reform the image of Matthew Winkler by bringing Patricia on the stand. Patricia testified that her father had never been ugly to her mother and was a great father before having to recount the horrors of seeing her father breathe his last breaths. It also came to light that Patricia only saw her mother once since the arrest, and that when she did, she was lied to. Diane Winkler also testified to this, stating Mary Carroll told him she hadn't killed Matthew and, justifiably, the whole family was pissed off at her for it. Mary Carroll would finally take the stand on April 18th, 2007, and say in her own words why her marriage came to such a bloody end. As a conservative, very religious woman, she testified to how Matthew would press her to engage in sexual activities that, by her standards, were unnatural and X-rated. She would be coerced into engaging in oral and anal sex, as well as be told to dress up in an afro wig, miniskirts, and 8-inch stiletto heels Mary Carroll considered to be slutty and fit for a hooker. Each item described was brought to the stand in an odd form of show-and-tell just to emphasize upon the point of their defense. She spoke about how Matthew was obsessed with pornography and would watch it before they were intimate, how he would also punch and kick her. The next point the defense made was that even though Mary Carroll had retrieved the shotgun and pointed it at the back of her sleeping husband, she had not fired the gun and never intended to use it. She spoke of the circumstances that led to the murder as well, detailing how she had had a fight over finances with Matthew the night before. It had come to light that Mary Carroll had fallen for a Nigerian scam, depositing multiple fraudulent checks into the Winkler joint bank accounts that took her for over $17,000. After this fight, she said she thought the following. He had really been on me lately, criticizing me for things, the way I walk, I eat, everything. It was building up to a point, I was just tired of it. I guess I got to a point and snapped. She stated she had only gotten the shotgun and pointed it at Matthew to force him to talk about their problems. I just wanted him to stop being so mean. And then, boom. All I knew was that the stupid gun had went off and nobody would believe me and they would just take my girls away from me. She was also asked why she had said she was never abused in her initial statement to police during her testimony. I was ashamed. I didn't want anybody to know about Matthew. Both Rudy Thompson and Amy Redmond would take the stand to restate their claims made in the Glamour publication and on Good Morning America. The prosecution had absolutely no way to combat all of this and missed valuable opportunities throughout the trial to make any case of severe guilt, which would become clear three weeks later after jury deliberation. The jury only took eight hours to come back and announce that Mary Carol Winkler was guilty of a lesser charge of voluntary manslaughter, which is defined as a crime of passion produced by adequate provocation sufficient to lead a reasonable person to act in an irrational manner. Instead of the 50 plus years the prosecution was looking for, she was looking at three to six years for this much lesser charge as a first time felon. Though the courtroom was packed with people who loved both Mary Carol and Matthew, there was nothing but silence when this ruling was announced. Both defense attorneys would speak to the press outside the courthouse, Faree speaking first about the plea bargains offered. We were offered 35 years, we were offered 20 years, we were offered 15 years, and now we're looking at 3 to 6 years. My reaction is the verdict was most probably just. Ballm would also add to these statements. There are no winners. We're left with the memory of Matthew Winkler, and even though there have been a lot of negative things said about him in this trial, there was a good side to him too. You heard that from Mary, he could be good at times. This is the case about two people who had a tumultuous marriage of some 10 years that ended in tragedy. Nothing good about it. Before the sentencing hearing even started, the jury foreman, Billy Barry, would speak with Court TV about his feelings towards the jury selection. He stated that he believed the jury heavily favored the defense and was therefore unbalanced and unfair. He divulged that nine of the ten women on the jury wanted to full-blown let her quote-unquote just walk free with an acquittal and that the manslaughter charge was merely a compromise. He believed that the testimony of abuse was a half-truth, that the mental abuse was the only thing that could have possibly happened. He also stated that he believed the maximum sentence should be passed down and gave one quote that was very telling. I don't think justice was done. It's the times we're living in. People are getting away with murder today. The hearing lasted five 
hours purely because of the amount of testimony given on the behalf of Mary Carroll, the prosecution arguing for the max sentence of six years while the defense argued for probation. Mary Carroll would once again take the stand along with ten others testifying on her behalf to read a statement about how remorseful she was to have killed her late husband. I've suffered the loss of someone I loved. I've lost my freedom, I've lost my children, and I've had my life be put on public display. I think of Matthew every day and the guilt, and I will always miss him and love him. And I wish I could have that good Matthew and we could live together forever. I hope this situation sheds light on unhealthy relationships and that others will find the strength and have courage to seek help before such a tragedy occurs again. The judge, Judge McGraw, also received 90 letters of recommendation on Mary Carroll's behalf on top of the 10 in-person statements on stand. On the behalf of Matthew, his direct family would testify, Dan Winkler Jr. being one of the first. I've watched as the life of my brother has been turned into a circus. I don't see any remorse. The most emotional point came when Diane Winkler took the stand. You broke your girl's hearts. Mary, you've destroyed your husband's character. You destroyed his good name. You accused him of being a monster who abused and belittled you. Girls, you're sorry. Don't you think you at least owe them that? You've never told us. You're sorry. I think you at least owe us that. Judge McGraw then spent 25 minutes reading his edict on her sentence in which he did not say anything negative towards Mary Carroll other than acknowledging that she was eligible for a prison sentence based on the act being violent, shocking, and reprehensible. In fashioning this sentence, the court has considered the seriousness of the offense and the jury's verdict of the testimony about allegations of abuse of the defendant. Mary Carol Winkler was sentenced to 210 days in prison, minus time served of 143 days, and an additional 60 days in a mental health facility. Once again, the room was silent. Mary Carroll would be released from custody on August 14, 2007, after spending five months in a county jail and two months in a mental health facility. Even though the trial was over and her time in custody had ended, she still had to contend with her in-laws. She still had to deal with a dual case of a $2 million wrongful death civil suit and the motion to terminate her custody of her three children. After almost a year of litigation, Dan and Diane Winkler were seen embracing Mary Carroll outside of the courtroom. Behind the scenes, the Winklers and Mary Carroll had reconciled and an agreement was reached in August 2008 that she would regain custody of her three daughters. A hearing on September 19th, 2008 approved and made this agreement official in the eyes of the court. Mary Carroll would speak with the press after this hearing at Carroll County Chancery Court to explain that she and her former in-laws had mended bridges. That was not my first time to hug them today. We've been seeing each other regularly. We love each other and we're getting along. We've reconciled. The last development I could find regarding Mary Carroll and her former in-laws is an article by Action 5 News from January 19, 2010 regarding a ruling against Diane and Dan Winkler. The Winklers were found to have paid for their custody battle with Mary Carroll using trust fund money set aside for their three granddaughters without the permission of the court. Chancellor Ron Harmon stated that they misrepresented donations for the benefit of the minor children as having been made to the fictitious Dan and Diane Winkler Fund. The Huntington Fund paid for all attorney expenses and a total of $175,000 was ordered to be repaid to the fund. In my opinion, outside of everything else, that's pretty disgusting. To this day, this case has been contentious among the public. Some believe that her sentencing was the right outcome because of the circumstances surrounding her case. Some believe that this was a failure of the criminal justice system because of her gender and biases towards it. This divide can clearly be seen in the closing segment of the September 2007 episode of The Oprah Winfrey Show where the host asked the opinion of people heavily involved in the case. A female court TV representative spoke to how horrifyingly easy Mary Carroll got away with what happened while two of her defense attorneys continued to recount the story given during the trial. Hopefully what I've been able to provide to you in this video has given you enough information to make your own decision because at the end of the day, that is what is most important. And with that, we can close this case file and I'll see you in the next video, sweet nightmares. I wanted to take this time to thank my Patreons and channel members. Your support is so greatly appreciated and I can't thank you enough. 
If you'd like to become a Patreon, there is a link in the description below. And if you'd like to become a channel member, just go ahead and click that join button and join the Truth Sleuths and Horror Hounds. All channel members and Patreons receive 24-hour access to videos prior to their public release and exclusive updates on my progress. After a certain tier, you can request that I do a certain topic or movie review, or you can even request that I do a game live stream, whichever works for you. At the highest tier, you not only get to choose the topic in which I cover, you get to either co-host the stream or the video that I do that covers said topic no matter if it's one or multiple. Of course, this is not obligatory. If you want to support the channel, I greatly appreciate it. And once again, thank you so much.